Good morning, good morning. Welcome to New Mercies. Good to see everybody this morning. Let's, uh, let's take this morning's worship to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to get together this morning and to worship you. We thank you for all the folks that are able to make it this morning, and we pray for those that who aren't able to make it as well. We ask that you'd be with Pastor and that you'd reach out to his words, that those words might reach our hearts, and that we might carry that with us this week so that others might see you in us. We pray, Lord, then that you would guide and direct us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with us and help us make a joyful noise. You know, it was... Um, 1957, and I'm not doing this off of memory, the World Series was the New York Yankees, the beloved Yankees, right? And uh, the Milwaukee Brewers. And uh, of course, New York was favored to win. And Hank Aaron for the, New York, for the uh, uh, Milwaukee Brewers walks up to the plate, and as he walks up to the plate and he taps his bat like they normally do, Yogi Bear is the catcher for New York, and he looks over at him, he says, uh, you know you're holding the bat wrong, you gotta be able to read the trademark. And Hank Aaron never even looked at him, he just walked right up to the plate, and he spoke as he walked up, and he said, I'm not here to read, I'm here to hit. And if you know the rest of the story, the Milwaukee upset New York, and they won the, uh, the World Series that year. A lot of people in sports, like golfers and different things like that, will say, do you inhale or exhale when you swing? The idea is to get you off your game, to make you think about something else other than what you're there to do. And I challenge you, how many times does Satan get in our heads and challenge you? Just as you're getting ready to do something, he says, ah, you can't do that, or they don't like you, or you're not smart enough, or you don't have the intelligence or the wisdom or the talent to do that thing or this thing. And how many times are we in that spot where we have the choice to make? Are we going to stick with what we know is right and just go forward? I'm not here to read. I'm here to hit. I'm not here to think about all those other things. I'm here to worship. And that's what we're here to do this morning. My King, you are my King. Amazing love. Sing with us. prayer. Father, we are thankful for your love and for the opportunity to know that no matter what happens in life, that you have promised to be with us. I pray for each of these that have been mentioned, for those that are going through illness and recovering, uh, for Susie, uh, that you just watch over and uh, keep her safe and help her to have a, a healthy delivery. 
pray for those that are going through troubles and difficulties. I just ask that we would look to you and surrender our life to you, that you could work and accomplish your will in our lives. Father, I thank you for the church family here. Pray that we can encourage each other, that we would look to you as our Lord and King, and that we would put our trust and confidence in you. Pray that you'd be with us this morning, that the scriptures that we look at would uh, come alive to us, and that we would put our confidence in you. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We're in a series uh, from the book of James. <clears throat> we realize that uh, with everything going on, some people are suffering from uh, medical issues, <clears throat> but we are all suffering from the dis-ease uh, that uh, we're going through because of the, the worries and things that we have. Many reasons for stress. No fair this year. Uh, you know, the fair is kind of a staple in Jogger County in the fall, uh, but uh, this year there's no fair. Next Sunday, my stepfather's celebrating his 100th anniversary. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I guess I need to think a little more. His, his 100th birthday and uh, can't have a party. He won't be in a group of more than two people besides himself. He's, you know, very concerned. So they're going to do a drive-by at the First Church of Christ in Painesville next Sunday at 2 o'clock. So, you know, it's kind of sad that it can't be a big celebration where everybody gets to sit and visit and uh, talk about old times. School is starting. Uh, some people are going to school. Some people are doing online learning. Uh, no college football. No Buckeyes, you know, this fall. It's going to be hard. I, I could care less about the professional sports, but I do uh, enjoy college football. So we know there's a lot of reasons, uh, a lot of stress going on. And so we've been looking at things about how to overcome the, what are the difficulties. And this morning, we want to look at a positive thing that will help us get through all the negative things. So how do we get through all of this? We have to have hope. Hope is something that no matter how hard things go, if you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, if you can see some good down the road, it can help you get through the hard times. We can go through a lot if we have hope. If we don't have hope, uh, we might as well give up because if there's no hope. But I think as Christians, now is the time to really say, where's our faith? You know, I've said on several occasions, when I look at Christianity, I look at two, two aspects of Christianity. I look at my relationship with God, my belief in God, the fact that I know there's a God that created the world, and that that God that created the world is involved in the world today. And so we know that there is God and that he is involved, he's in our lives, and he can change whatever circumstances there are in the world. And then there's the aspect of how we get along with each other. I mean, the Bible teaches us, you know, the key words to Christianity are love, grace, humility, you know, these things which we look at and we can say, that's how we can get through life, is if we treat each other, if we honor others, you know, above ourselves if we care about each other, if we're humble. But I think through this time, we need to focus a little bit on both of those things, but maybe more so on the fact that there is a God and he's involved. Jesus was born of a woman. He lived, he performed miracles, he died for our sins, and he rose again and he ascended back into heaven. If we understand and know that, if that's what our faith is, then we know that whatever we go through now is not as serious as what we know will be for eternity. <clears throat> um, in the book of James, the fifth chapter, it says, 
James 5 eight says, you also must be patient. Keep your hopes high for the day of the Lord's coming is near. We know that he's coming back. We know that he came before. We know that he is. And therefore, we need to keep our hopes high. And we can do that because we know it's a God that we trust. You know, we sing the song, you know, I'm forgiven because... Uh, I have to sing a song to get the words, but I'm accepted because he was condemned. You know, he is my king. Amazing love that God would come and die for me. But those are things that we sing about. But do we really believe that there is that God that loved us that much? And that is the source of the hope that we have. We have to have hope. We know how important hope is when it comes to our spiritual lives and to our mental lives. But even our physical lives, hope is very important. You know, several doctors, I don't have their names, but uh, one doctor said, hope is the medicine I use more than any other for physical. Even our physical well-being requires that we have hope. Another doctor says, if I can't give people hope, it's like nailing another nail you know, in their coffin. You know, that's, that's pretty serious. So for our mental well-being and even our physical well-being, we need to have hope, and that hope comes from God. Our faith is what keeps us hopeful. It's not just wishful thinking, but it's the knowledge that there is a God, that that God is involved, and because he's involved, our life can be a better place. So our hope is based on that knowledge of what God says. And there are several things in the book of James that, that talk about the reason uh, that we are able to have this hope. And the first thing I want to look at is that we know that this trouble won't last. You know, we go through a hard time, but we know we're going to get through it. You know, th there's an expression, I don't think this is from the Bible, this too shall pass. You know, whenever you're going through something, it's hard when you're going through it. Uh, you know, when your kids were little, some of you have little kids, and some of our kids are very old. But when your kids were little, did it seem like they were going to be in diapers forever? <laughs> did it seem like you were going to get up in the middle of the night forever? You know, that they would, you know, be little toddlers forever? But we know that it's not the case. And as you look back, you say that was a moment in time. Everything that we go through <clears throat> will pass. But even if we face something that we have to deal with all of our life on earth, some people have chronic conditions that they will struggle with all their life as long as they're alive. But from the perspective of eternity, even that, you know, is a short, a, a short period of time. Um, in the fifth chapter, James 5, it says, take the old prophets as your mentors. They put up with everything, went through everything, never once quit, all the time honoring God. What a gift life is to those who stay the course. You know, they went through hard times. As we look at the Old Testament, uh, some scriptures that we're not too familiar with, you know, the Israelite people were taken captive and they were taken into Babylon. And there they were, in times of Daniel, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fiery furnace and all that. Um, in Psalm 137, it says, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for a song. Our tormentors demanded, sing of joy, they said. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? So they went through hard times. And many of those that were taken captive, they were in captivity for 70 years. Many of them never never got out and were able to go back to the land. And when they were able to go back, uh, they rebuilt the temple, but Solomon's temple was one of the great wonders of that ancient world. 
beautiful, magnificent building, and then they rebuilt the temple, but it was just a shadow of the glory of the first temple. And in Ezra, Ezra and Nehemiah are the, the people that wrote about that time. It says, but many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud as they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. It was going to be nothing compared to the glory of the temple that was before. But they were faithful through that time, even though it was a difficult time. We don't know how long the, the trouble that we're going through is going to last. But as Christians, we are not living for this world. We are living for eternity. And that is, needs to be the goal that we have. In uh, 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, uh, there's verse 18, the second half, if you have the sheet, the second half of that. It says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Don't most people look at that the other way? If you can't see it, it's not real. When in reality, the things that are real are the things that are unseen, and the things that are seen are the things that are only temporary. They're, they're not going to last long. They're, they're here and they're going to be gone. And everything is gonna fall apart. Everything that you have gets old. You know, you buy a new vehicle and you know, five, six, seven years later, it starts to fall apart. Our bodies, uh, you know, they, they kind of fall apart a little bit, you know. I have to wear suspenders now uh, most of the time because my pants don't stay up because my body's changing and, you know, uh, I'm not 16 anymore, you know. So things change. Things wear out. But if we look from an eternal perspective, we don't worry about these things. And, you know, it's just a quick thought here. Sometimes we worry about the unknown, what might happen. We spend more time worrying about what might happen. And maybe it won't, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But don't worry about it until it does. But worry, you know, is not a good thing. Let's deal with what we have to and, and go forward. So we know that this will not last. The second thing we know is that God will use everything for our good. Romans 8, 28, very familiar passage of scripture. I don't think I even printed it. We know that in everything God works, everything for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. So we know that as we go through trials and troubles, God will bring good through those troubles. They make us stronger. You know, uh, it, that's kind of the way it is. And uh, James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You know, if you don't do anything, you know, somebody, uh, I knew somebody that was kind of laid up for several months and they said, it's hard to get back. You know, if you're not exercising and using what it is, if you're not tested going through things, then, you know, you, you become weak and you don't, you lose your strength. Uh, so we need to develop that strong character. Maybe we're tired. But as we look back, only sometimes as we look back can we see the good that was coming out of a situation. And consider this, isn't this life preparation for eternity? You know, we live here now, then we stand before God and we get our reward. This life is a preparation for the life to come. God wants to know who are you? Do you love me? Do you trust me? Are you following what I say because you love me? How are we doing? You know, is God pleased with how we're living? We're preparing now for the time that we can be in heaven. Are we doing good at that? In 2 Corinthians, um, <clears throat> the first part of that verse that's listed there says, therefore we do not lose heart, 
Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I mean, James was writing to people that were going through severe persecution. And he said, these light and momentary troubles, we'd look at them and say, that's not light and momentary, that's, you know, life and death. But compared to eternity, they're light and momentary. Do we view life from an eternal perspective? Or are we like the rest of the world that you only go around once so you've got to reach for all the gusto you can, you know? This life is all there is, so you better make the best of it. No, this life isn't all there is, and we show God in this life who we are so that he welcomes us into the kingdom of God. Next thing that we need to understand is that getting upset doesn't help. Let's think about that for a minute. We, we can be upset about everything. Uh, no matter what you say, there are people that will disagree with you. You know, you should wear a mask. No, you shouldn't. Masks aren't good. You know, you can get an argument about everything. You know, the, uh, the, the, the medical experts, they don't agree. You know, some say this, some say that. Uh, they don't agree. So no matter whether it's the politicians, the mask wearers, the, the, the experts, everybody, no matter what you do, you're gonna have somebody that's gonna disagree with you. And uh, we know in James it says we should be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry because man's anger does not bring about God's righteousness. So we can get angry over a lot of things, but getting upset doesn't help. Does your getting upset help you? Does your getting upset help the others that you're around? You know, how many like to be around people that are always ye angry and yelling and mad and upset, you know? Um, it doesn't help, so we, we, we shouldn't do it. Uh, it's easy to take our frustrations out on those that are around us. And sometimes our family is the one that's around us most, and they bear the brunt of that. Uh, the verse right after the first one we read in James 5 says, do not complain against one another, my friends, so that God will not judge you. You know, there's several places in the Bible where the bad sins are listed. You know, murder, anger, and you know that grumbling is listed with those other sins. So grumbling is not a good thing. It's one of the, one of the, bad, the bad sins. But anybody guilty? Number four, we know that trusting God pleases him. Do you want to please God? Then trust him. If someone trusts you, what does that do to your relationship? I mean, someone comes up to you and says, you know, I really trust your wisdom. I look up to you. I respect who you are. Isn't that one of the greatest compliments that anybody can give you, is to say that I trust you, I'm looking to you for guidance? I think it was Mark Twain said, I can live all day on an honest compliment. You know, so it makes us feel good. And when we trust God, that makes God feel good because he says, that's my child. They trust me. They're looking to me. And so we follow what he says, and he is able then uh, to, uh, to be there uh, for us. Abraham trusted God, and uh, it was credited to him as righteousness. In, in James, the second chapter, it says, it says, you see that his faith, referring to Abraham, and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God. Abraham believed and trusted God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. God's friend. Do you want to be God's friend? Do you want to just know about God? Uh, yeah. You know about a person. I mean, I know a few people that are kind of influential, you know, maybe in the Cleveland area. And uh, 
Some people know about them, but they're my friends. And that, that means a whole lot to me to know that I don't just know about them, but I know them. They know me, and we're friends. And that's, you know, I think that goes what I was talking about before is the confidence and the trust and the respect that develops so that we can know God and that we can be a friend of God. Just as Abraham was faithful to God and they'd had a relationship then that grew beyond just knowing each other, but that they became friends. That I, I think is, is, is a key thing to, to understand you know, in this situation. So we trust him. Next thing is we can have hope because we know that Jesus is coming back. That's, that's key. You know, there's much more written about Jesus' second return than his first coming. You know, if you want to do a program for Christmas, there's a few scriptures. Micah 5, 2, you know, talks about born in Bethlehem. Isaiah talks about, you know, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. There's not a lot of scriptures from the Old Testament that talk about his first coming. Enough to know that it was planned ahead and everything worked out. It's enough that these prophecies help give us that foundation of faith. But there's much more talk about his coming back. You know, John 14, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me and my father's house are many mansions. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. So we know that Jesus was here. He died for our sins, he rose again, he's now preparing a place for us, and he's gonna come back and he's gonna take us to that place that's so much better uh, than anything uh, that we can imagine. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful place, and uh, I, I put down uh, kind of the signs of the time. We don't know when he's coming, but I know one thing for sure, it's one day sooner than it was yesterday. <laughs> You know, and as we look at, you know, uh, Timothy, Paul writing to Timothy says, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, uh, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, wrath, conceited, uh, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Sound like today's times? I think everything there, you know, is today. So Christ's return uh, could be even today. And when he comes back, he will right the wrongs. He will correct the injustice. He will judge those that reject him and he will welcome those that love him and are faithful to him into the kingdom of God. And this could be you know, at any time, going back to our, our first verse that says, for the day of the Lord's coming is near. It's here. So that, that gives us hope. He's coming back. And uh, this life is not the end of the story. Um, the, the middle of the story is usually messy, right? Maybe it's pretty messy right now. But it's a good novel. What's What's characteristic of a good novel or, or a Hallmark movie, you know? What happens? There's got to be trouble in the middle. You know, I wish you could just watch it and everything works out fine, but you know, we all know that 30 minutes before Hallmark movie's over, everything's falling apart and it looks hopeless. But then, in the end, you know, everything falls into place and they live happily ever after. What a lie. <laughs> I mean, it's not that easy. Don't we wish that it was? But there's the messy part of life, and maybe that's what we're going through right now. Will things ever get back to normal? We don't know. Some say two years, some say a year. We don't know. But maybe it never will get back to normal because what is normal? But we put our hope in God not in anything else, it's not in our job, it's not in our ability to deal with it, but it's in our hope in God that, that everything will work out. The last thing we want to look at this morning is the reason we have hope is we will be rewarded one day. 
one of my favorite old songs, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. All the trials and troubles and stuff we go through, it'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. We'll look back and it'll all be a, a distant memory. Uh, we'll be in the presence of God. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, we can uh, receive the crown of life that, that he promises uh, to us. It says, blessed are those who persevere under trials because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So we are trusting in the promise of God. We are not trusting in our ability to get through it. We are trusting in the promise that God has made. And because his promises are true, we can have confidence in what he, what he has said and, and given to us. <clears throat> the reward that God has promised. We can't imagine what heaven is going to be like. It's, uh, I saw a person interviewed one time <clears throat> that was born blind, never was able to see, but then through a medical procedure, the person was able to see. And they were just overwhelmed. They said, I couldn't understand what people were talking about. And that's the way it is. <clears throat> when I was in Bible college, uh, Johnson Bible College Choir uh, was somewhere in Indiana, I think Winona Lake, where Virgil Brock and his wife lived. Virgil Brock wrote the song, Beyond the Sunset. Uh, and he shared with us how he wrote that song. They were at a family gathering in the evening and there was a terrible storm went through. And then after the storm, you know, there was a beautiful rainbow and a beautiful sunset. And one of the couples, one of the people that was there was blind. And they tried to describe to that blind person what they were able to see. And that was the background for the song, Beyond the Sunset. Beyond what we are able to see is the hope of what God has for us. We can't imagine it because we can't experience it. The only thing we can know is the things that we experience. You know, we talk about, well, that's a tree. Well, we see a tree and we know what it is because we see it and we put a name to it. But the reward in heaven is beyond our understanding because we can't imagine something that we have never experienced. But that is what God has <clears throat> for us. Those things that, that will last uh, forever. Um, <clears throat> in uh, 1 Corinthians 9.25 it says, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. So that, that's a part of the discipline, the stress that we go through, the, the struggle is the training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So the struggles we're going through are winning for us a wreath, a crown that will last forever. <clears throat> uh, First Peter says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last days. That's our final hope that we have uh, when, when that all happens. It says, in all of this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief and trials of all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We don't see it, 
but we see the evidence of God. We see the evidence that God is here. It's reasonable to understand and know that God created this, that God is concerned about us, and that because Jesus came, uh, he is involved and he will come again. In Romans 8, 18, he says, As I consider that our pre present suffering is worth nothing compared to the glory that be, will be revealed in us. Our hope is only as good as what our hope is in. A lot of people put hope in a lot of things. They put hope in a person that'll make them happy. They put hope in a job that they think will make their life meaningful. But only hope in God, who is eternal, powerful, is a source of a hope that can sustain us through whatever it is that we have known. You know, many of us have grown up in the church and we have a pretty firm concept of what this means. But one thing that I have learned in my life is that sometimes we assume that everybody has the same understanding that we do. But if you didn't grow up knowing the Bible, if you didn't grow up with people of faith, then this is a concept that is totally new. And so <clears throat> those of us that have a mature faith have to share that hope with others that haven't had the privilege of knowing the things that we have known and having had the experiences that we have had. You know, I, I love the old songs, you know, the old country church, I could listen to that song every night. I'd love to go back to the old country church, you know, to hear the songs of praise. You know, those memories are so precious to me because that's where my faith developed. But not everyone had that opportunity and so we need to take a hope to a world and let them know that there is a real hope that comes because there is a real God. And so I hope that everyone here today knows that God created this world, that sin came into the world and destroyed the goodness that God made. And eventually God had to send his son into the world and that son came to teach us how to live the right way and then die for us because we have lived the wrong way. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God through Jesus Christ is eternal life and that hope that we had lost can be restored if we put our trust and our confidence in him. Not in a political system or a religious system, but in a God that came and gave his life. I am forgiven because he was forsaken. Amazing love, how can it be that the God of the universe would come and die for me? Sounds too good to be true, but that's the God that we serve. Father, we thank you that uh, we don't go through life alone, that you were there, that you're coming back, that we have a reason to have hope no matter what happens in this world. <clears throat> but we're thankful that you still bless us even in this life. We have so many reasons to be thankful and we acknowledge that every good and perfect gift comes from you. Help us to share that message of hope with a world in despair. And may our confidence always be in you. In Jesus' name, amen.